So uh, I will uh, hand over to Dr. Al Anza, who uh, is a recently graduated, very recently graduated uh, uh, PhD student from War Studies Department at King's uh, and uh, supervised successfully by Professor Andrew Lambert. Uh, I don't know the full title of your doctorate. Uh, the Laws of War and Naval Strategy in Great Britain and the United States, 1899 to 1909. Okay, so, and this is one uh, dimension thereof. I might probably sit facing the other direction. This pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, <clears throat> thank you, Professor uh, Philpot, and uh, thank you to uh, IHR and the Military History uh, Research Seminar for having me here uh, as. Professor Philpott indicated this is a, in effect, a part of a subsection of a chapter of my recently completed PhD thesis. Um, and I'm here to talk about the uh, 1909 Declaration of London and uh, whether the Admiralty uh, really knew what it was doing there. Um, the London Naval Conference of 1909 was the last of the three international conferences to address the laws of naval warfare in the first decade of the 20th century. It was the most exclusive, with only nine major sea powers and the Netherlands in attendance. Called by Great Britain, the conference was intended to establish agreement among the major sea powers on the generally recognized principles of international law to be applied by the International Prize Court established at the 1907 Hague Conference. The Declaration Concerning the Laws of Naval War produced by the 1909 Conference represented hard-fought compromises. Indeed, the conference teetered on the brink of dissolution several times due to the refusal of certain nations, first Germany and then the United States, to compromise their traditional positions. Immediately after the conference, Great Britain's representatives the Admiralty and the Foreign Office praised the results achieved. Given the approbation of the conference's outcome by participants, the Declaration of London seemed destined for ratification. However, the Declaration was subjected almost immediately to intense criticism in Britain. The subsequent arguments and debates that led to its rejection have been analyzed repeatedly. Uh, opponents of the Declaration primarily raised two arguments against it. First. They claim that the Declaration unduly restricted Britain's rights as a belligerent by permitting only a traditional close blockade of an enemy's co coast and ports. Modern naval weapons such as torpedo boats, mines, and submarines, however, made such a traditional close blockade impractical, if not impossible. <clears throat> John Coogan, in The End of Neutrality, concludes that, quote, Fisher, Arthur Wilson, Slade, Otley, and other senior, senior officials simply did not understand that the technological changes which made close blockade suicidal had rendered an effective commercial blockade of Germany impossible. Coogan's conclusion is contrary to everything known about these officers. His view that senior admiralty officials did not understand that technological changes precluded a traditional close blockade an argument concocted and promoted by Maurice Hankey at the time, is wrong. It ignores that in the Declaration, the area of operations of blockading warships was the area within which seizures could occur. It also ignores the report of the drafting committee to the conference, which made clear that Article 17, which the, contained the concept of rayon d'action, that's my poor French, uh, was adopted in light of all modern means of defense. Article 17, along with the provisions that general notice of a blockade was sufficient and whether a blockade was effective was a question of fact and that a single ship could effectively blockade a port, allowed for execution of a blockade under modern and distant conditions. Uh, the obvious immediate effect upon the operational ability of the Navy was that the new interpretation of commercial blockade under the Declaration of London freed it from conducting a close commercial blockade off the coast and ports of the enemy thereby reflecting the operational limitations imposed by mutual sea denial. The second argument opponents raised against the Declaration of the time was that it unreasonably limited neutral rights and expanded the rights of belligerents to the detriment of Britain's ability to maintain its food supply during war. The Declaration classified foodstuffs as conditional contraband. 
conditional contraband presumptively could be seized only if consigned to a fortified place belonging to the enemy or other place serving as a base for, uh, for the armed forces of the enemy. According to opponents, Britain's food supply therefore could, could be interdicted even if such goods were on board neutral merchant ships uh, because every vital port in Britain arguably was fortified or near a military base. This argument relied on reading the word enemy in Article 34 of the Declaration broadly as not limited to the enemy government. Again, the report of the drafting committee showed that enemy, as used in the context of Articles 30, 33, and 34 of the Declaration, meant a fortified place belonging to the enemy or a place used as a base. Neutral vessels whose goods were not consigned directly <coughs> to the enemy government or its agent, therefore, were not presumptively subject to seizure if bound for most ports. Moreover, the Declaration's drafters had successfully opposed a German attempt to broaden base to include any port in the neighborhood of which a military garrison, however insignificant in size, was stationed. Thus, the report of the drafting committee, the drafting history, and a normal interpretation of the critical words renders the second primary argument of the Declaration's opponents meritless. In light of these facts, historians such as Coogan, Abner Offer, Offer, and most recently Nicholas Lambert in his book Planning Armageddon, have struggled to explain adequately Britain's supposed failure to protect its belligerent rights at the Declaration at the London Conference. They have alleged mendacity and incompetence on the part of the Admiralty and the First Lord, Reginald McKenna, Sir Hugh Strawn, for example, simply concludes, quote, the only rationalization of the Admiralty's and of Fisher's position is hard-headed cynicism, that in the event of Britain being at war, the Declaration of London would be neglected. In the event of neutrality, it would be enforced. I contend that fairly read, the meeting minutes and communications exchanged at the Admiralty and with the Foreign Office before and during the conference reveal a full ventilation of the pros and cons of the various positions taken and of what to demand in return for surrendering certain belligerent rights. The Admiralty understood fully the positions being taken and there was no preconceived plan to simply ignore the Declaration of London in time of war. In fact, the results of the conference were a good outcome for the Admiralty and the Royal Navy that subsequently was lost when ratification of the Declaration of London failed in the House of Lords in December 1911. Now, the London Conference of 1909 uh, had its genesis in Britain's desire for the International Prize Court, established by Convention 12 at the 1907 Hague Conference, to have an established and agreed body of law to apply in cases brought before it. Britain had issues regarding the scope of blockade and the doctrine of continuous voyage at the 1907 conference. In late 1907, Sir Charles Otley, the British naval delegate, told the Foreign Office that while a compromise with Germany might prove acceptable to France and other powers, it likely was too late in the conference to obtain the necessary approval of all the nations present. He sought consent to tell the delegates from the principal naval powers that blockade along with two or three other purely naval questions, would be discussed at a small conference to be held in London in the spring of 1908. At the 1907 conference, Germany had tied an agreement on blockade and contraband to abolition of the doctrine of continuous voyage. It wanted to limit the area within which a neutral merchant ship attempting to avoid a blockade could be seized, such that a ship carrying contraband but heading for a neutral port next to a blockaded port could not be stopped. Britain and the Admiralty wanted to be able to seize a neutral ship carrying contraband anywhere within an area 800 miles from a blockaded port. Interestingly, the Admiralty viewed the 800 mile limitation as a, quote, tremendous concession, close quote, because its existing rules would enable it to capture a vessel so it said, quote, even at Yokohama, if she was proceeding to a European blockade port. The Foreign Office concluded that the distance between these positions was so wide that it may be doubted whether it can ever be re reached over even at a future conference. 
Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey reluctantly decided to defer any further attempts to reach an understanding on blockade and contraband until a new conference in the spring of 1908. Doing, doing so meant, quote, an interminable delay in the creation of the Prize Court of Appeal on which the delegates had reached agreement because an understanding on contraband and blockade would, quote, form a most important code of law for the new court to apply. Britain was concerned that concerned what legal principles would be applied by the newly formed Price Court of Appeal, given that its positions on the laws of naval warfare were viewed very differently, that is, pro-belligerent rights compared with those of continental powers. Captain Edmund Slade had been appointed Director of Naval Intelligence in November 1907 succeeding Otley, who became secretary of the Committee of Imperial Defense. Slade first discussed the planned naval conference with Otley and Air Crow of the Foreign Office on January 8, 1908. Shortly thereafter, Gray asked if the Admiralty agreed with holding the conference of leading naval powers and identified eight other countries, not including the Netherlands at the time, to invite. He suggested creating a small committee to decide the specifics the specific topics for the conference and to prepare a memorandum on Britain's position on each topic and how far the maintenance of the British doctrine on each point is really vital to the interests of this country and what concessions it would be possible to make in order to secure unanimity among all the powers. Slade concurred in the Foreign Office's suggestion. He recognized the importance of having an agreed code of naval warfare before the 1907 Prize Court Convention was ratified. The proposed code had to be viewed from two aspects. First, when Britain was belligerent, and second, when it was neutral. Slade concluded, of these, the former is far more important. The code of law may mean all the difference between the effectiveness of our main weapon or its comparative ineffectiveness when we are a belligerent. Assistant Admiralty Secretary W. Graham Green agreed and suggested Slade should be one of the Admiralty's representatives on the proposed committee. Then First Lord of the Admiralty, Lord Tweedmouth, concurred. First Sea Lord, Admiral Sir John Fisher, likely received Gray's proposal and the minutes of Slade and Green. The first page of the Admiralty's minutes on Gray's proposal indicates with a large check mark that they were referred to Fisher. Slade promptly began preparations for the London Conference. The other members of the Naval Conference Committee were the Earl of Dessart, uh, Eyre Crow and C.J.B. Hurst from the Foreign Office, and Otley. Slade and Otley were primarily responsible for preparation of the British positions. By 17 February, the draft invitation letter was finished. England identified eight subjects for discussion. I'm not going to read through them all here, but this is the, the first several, contraband, blockade, the doctrine of continuous voyage, <clears throat> Then we have the legality of destruction of neutral vessels, uh, rules as to neutral ships or persons rendering unneutral service, conversion of merchant vessel into a warship, rules for the, for the transfer of merchant vessels from a belligerent to a neutral flag, and the question of whether the nationality or the domicile of the owner should be adopted as the dominant factor in deciding whether property was enemy property. Britain asked invitees to the conference to submit memoranda on their views as to the correct rule of international law on each of the topics, along with the bases for those positions. Slade and the other committee members worked on Britain's positions in April and May of 1908. They soon recognized that the country, quote, cannot maintain the attitude adopted by the textbooks regarding blockade. The committee prepared a memorandum describing the country's positions on the eight subjects after analyzing British prize court decisions. Gray sent the memorandum to the other invited nations, which now included the Netherlands. Slade completed a detailed memorandum uh, on the positions Britain should take at the conference after analyzing the statements received from all the invited nations except the United States and Spain, which did not submit any reports. On contraband, he thought agreement could be reached on categories and itemization of contraband along the lines proposed at the 1907 Hague Conference. 
He also believed Britain could safely concede that a neutral ship carrying contraband was subject to seizure only if a certain proportion of its cargo was contraband. Regarding blockade, Slade determined that British prize court decisions were more in line with continental practices than generally believed. He concluded, quote, quote, it is therefore probable that we shall be able to arrive at a working compromise without endangering our interests. Slade suggested that the French rule regarding radius of action proposed in 1907, or at the 1907 conference could be adopted uh, if the conference agreed to a, quote, formula which is capable of wide interpretation and which will give us all that we were practically able to assert in former wars. <coughs> He recommended that the proposal made with the Admiralty's approval at the 1907 conference be modified to replace the 800-mile zone with an area of operation limited by the range of action of the vessels employed in maintaining the blockade. On continuous voyage, Slade concluded that the country faced a similar difficulty because British prize court decisions did not support the country's position. British prize courts, in fact, had applied nearly the same principles as France. Slade again thought the Admiralty's position from the 1907 Hague Conference could be slightly rephrased so that a neutral ship carrying contraband was liable to be seized anywhere if the ultimate destination of the goods was an enemy port, even if the vessel might first stop at neutral ports. The proposed rule did not limit the right to stop and search a neutral, subject to having to pay damages if a prize court later determined that a vessel had improperly been seized. This rule would avoid the abuses suffered during the Russo-Japanese War. However, application of the doctrine of continuous voyage to blockade could not be supported. The American Civil War prize court decision in the Springbok, which allowed seizure of contraband goods destined for a neutral port, because they ultimately were intended for a blockaded port, was very much more drastic than anything Britain had attempted to enforce, according to Slade. And the conversion of merchant ships into warships, enemy property, and the transfer of merchant ships to neutral owners during or in anticipation of war, Slade recommended that Britain either insist on its position or leave the question open. <clears throat> on the other topics for the conference, he thought the country could either safely concede its positions or that suitable compromises could be reached. Slade submitted his memorandum for approval by the Admiralty. Assistant Secretary Graham Green closely considered Slade's positions on contraband and blockade, on which their lordships last year were prepared to compromise, as Green stated. He concluded, as regards compromise, it is not now proposed to alter the rule that articles of contraband may be seized anywhere if the ultimate destination of the suspected cargo, cargo is hostile, even though the vessel may first call at neutral ports. As regards blockade, it is considered that an elastic rule, substituting radius of action of the blockading vessels for an arbitrary 800 mile zone is preferable in several respects, while it gives practically all the latitude which we could reasonably require and is more in agreement with the actual line taken by British prize ports during our naval wars. The Admiralty's Naval Law Branch took a harder view. It noted that no international code of naval warfare necessarily could avoid adverse decisions by the International Prize Court. Nevertheless, if the International Prize Court was to become a reality, an agreement on some of the main principles of international law is naturally desirable and a compromise is necessary. Slaves can conclude the Naval Law Branch con concurred generally in Slade's conclusions as, quote, being the best possible in the circumstances and best calculated to bring about an agreement with other powers. The Naval Law Branch thought that while the concessions proposed were considerable, few of them viewed separately were of vital importance to Britain. The Naval Law Branch commented specifically on only two points relating to blockade. First, it did not believe British law was clear that liability for violating a blockade arose only from the attempt, not the intention to do so as long as blockades could be effectively maintained without relying on intent as the controlling factor, the point could be conceded. Second, the Naval Law Branch favored the 800 mile radius rule over the, over the radius of action rule. It described the latter as a convenient expression for ordinary purposes, but a lawyer could and would make it mean anything. Green responded to the Naval Law Branch's minute. 
he noted that the general question of whether there should be an international prize court had previously been decided and acquiesced in by the Admiralty. Moreover, the Naval Conference Committee's opinion was that the nation's interests would not suffer if the proposed compromises were made. Green recognized that the position of Britain as a neutral had to be considered as well as when it was a belligerent. Even as a belligerent, Britain would have to consider the interests of neutrals, quote, and except perhaps in the disputed areas or disputed issues of blockade and carriage of contraband as to which we are prepared to negotiate, we should be obliged to limit our action in any circumstances. He reminded that cases involving the seizure of enemy ships would not be within the International Prize Court's jurisdiction, only seizures of neutral vessels. Moreover, if Britain's powers now were compared with those during the last great naval war, the differences were due, quote, to the Declaration of Paris and the great change which has taken place in the maritime commerce world. Green also thought that an arbitrary and unscientific limit of 800 miles would result in disputes and opportunities for e evasion near the outer fringes of the radius. On the same day, the Naval Conference Committee presented a further report that restated the need for a convention on agreed rules of law for application by the International Prize Court. Some long-held rules were not entirely applicable under modern conditions. The committee had, quote, approached the consideration of the various points of controversy with a desire to reconcile divergence where possible, and in other cases where the divergences are too marked to be reconciled to find materials for compromise. The committee then reviewed its positions on the various topics for the conference. It thought agreement could be reached on lists of absolute and conditional contraband, but that neither food nor raw materials should be considered contraband unless destined for the enemy's armed forces. The ship, if a ship's destination was a neutral port, the con or contraband cargo could still be seized if its ultimate destination, whether by sea or land, was enemy territory. On blockade, the destination of the ship mattered, not the destination of the cargo. Recognizing that no serious limitation on Britain's ability to impose a blockade could be considered, the committee thought that the right of seizure of a blockading fleet should be, quote, defined as that of operating in area sufficiently large to secure it from the danger of attack from the shore and to enable it to effectively prevent entrance to or departure from the blockaded port or coast. Gray circulated the further report to the cabinet for approval, noting the only controversial sections were those dealing with blockade and transfer of title of merchant ships from belligerent to neutral owners. Slade concurred in Green's minute. First Lord McKenna, who had taken over from Tweedmouth, concurred generally, noting that while there is a good deal in the remarks of the Naval Law Branch on the subject of blockades, the recommendation that the 800 mile radius rule should be preferred if the conference will accept it. Fisher then wrote in his distinctive hand, initialed and dated, quote, concurred generally in the summary pages 24 and 25, referring to Slade's original memorandum, and, quote, concur in A, Close quote, referring to McKenna's preference for the 800 mile rule. Two weeks later, McKenna, Fisher, Second Sea Lord Admiral May, Green, and Slade met to discuss the attitude that would be taken up by the Admiralty at the forthcoming conference. Slade thought the discussion of blockade by McKenna showed, quote, that he had not the smallest conception of what was meant. The Second Sea Lord was not much better, close quote. However, after <coughs> hours discussion, they eventually decided to accept the views that Slade had put forward. At the meeting, Fisher, according to Slade's notes, quote, produced some wonderful statements, and they were swallowed by McKenna with evident gusto. They, Slade thought it was, quote, astonishing how Fisher forces his views down everybody's throat. The participants agreed that it was desirable to adopt the suggestion to treat, treat uh, rayon daction as governing the powers of seizure under international law. The group recognized it would be difficult to seize neutral ships bound for a blockaded port when there was an adjacent neutral port to which they could claim they were destined. The concept of area of action, therefore, was more advantageous because it provided, quote, the greatest latitude to the blockading force and permitted the widest dispersal of that force in order to stop all trade with a blockaded port. The effect of such a definition would be determined by the size of the force employed maintain and support the blockade. 
The Admiralty therefore authorized its representatives at the conference to adopt the positions described in Slade's memorandum. Foreign Secretary Gray's instructions to Britain's delegation provided relatively precise guidance on each of the subjects to be considered. For example, absolute and conditional contraband would be recognized, but the items in each category would be identified. Britain's absolute dependence on blockade for its security meant it was, quote, imperative, close quote, to maintain that weapon intact. Recognizing that modern armaments necessitated that any blockade fleet be stationed a considerable distance from the coast or ports blockaded, a rule defining rayon d'action as the, quote, area of operation of the blockading force would be acceptable and would safeguard all the belligerent rights in regard to blockade which Great Britain has been practically able to assert in former wars, while also assuring, reassuring neutrals that their ships would not be subject to seizure until actually approaching a blockade. On continu continuous voyage, neutral ships were subject to seizure if carrying contraband destined for the enemy, whether direct or via some intermediate conveyance by land or sea from a neutral port. Specific directions were provided on other topics. Gray reminded the delegates to ensure that those belligerent rights, quote, which have been proved in the past to be essential to the successful assertion of British sea power and to the defense of British independence are preserved undiminished and placed beyond rightful challenge. At the same time, he instructed, quote, the widest possible freedom for neutrals should remain before your eyes as the double object to be pursued. With this guidance, the British delegation certainly understood that Britain's belligerent rights had to be satisfactorily maintained. The conference opened at the Foreign Office on 8 December 1908 with a described as a rather colorless speech by Gray. It adjourned from 18 December to 11 January 1909 and concluded on 26 February. Slade was viewed as the mouthpiece of the British Navy. Otley rarely spoke. The first major issue that arose related to the doctrine of continuous voyage, whether to give up continuous voyage as applied to contraband was a significant issue for Britain. Slade reported that Germany was willing to make a deal and would agree to England's proposed lists of absolute and conditional contraband as suggested at the 1907 Hague Conference in return for Britain giving up continuous voyage. Slade recognized the significant implications of such a deal, which would, quote, prevent our stopping the whole of German trade by sea, because part of it could continue through neutral Belgian and Dutch ports. However, he concluded that the value of the doctrine to Britain was very doubtful for several reasons. First, it would not likely affect the enemy much, uh, and second, uh, the attempts to cause to uh, enforce it in the South African War, while it had caused great difficulties and cost to the <coughs> Boers, it did, resulted in Britain not maintaining its rights intact because of objections from Germany and the United States. That occurred at a time when Britain had absolute command of the sea and was, relative to the Germans at least, in as good a position as it was in the present day, if not better. Slade noted, however, that Germany thought Britain placed a high value on continuous voyage. He therefore believed that England should get more in return for abandoning continuous voyage than just agreed lists of absolute, conditional, and non-contraband. He thought Germany should compromise on its position that a belligerent had the right to sink neutral prizes. This right was of, was of no value to Britain as a belligerent, but if Germany would restrict this right to limited situations, with payment of compensation required, British maritime trade would gain significantly. The naval law branch stated that if continuous voyage as applies to contraband was abandoned, Britain would give up the right to seize neutral ships carrying contraband destined for the enemy. If the ship first stopped at a neutral port before continuing on to an enemy port, or if the ship's final destination was a neutral port. The law branch could not express any opinion as to the relative value vis-a-vis -vis the proposed lists of contraband items and restricting the right to sink neutral prizes. Assistant Secretary Green agreed that the relative value of the doctrine of continuous voyage depended on what was or was not contraband, ignoring the difficulties of determining its ultimate destination. In contrast, an agreement itemizing contraband would greatly benefit Britain, both as a belligerent, because it would be clear what goods could be seized, and as a neutral, given the size of its merchant marine. 
Whatever the decision, the law of blockade would not be limited. Green agreed that Britain should insist on its positions regarding a belligerent's right to sink neutral prices and the conversion of merchant ships on the high seas. Whether to bargain away continuous voyage in return for Germany agreeing to Britain's lists of contraband and free goods was the subject of a meeting on 15 December between Foreign Secretary Gray, First Lord McKenna, and the members of the British delegation. This meeting has been subjected to a variety of interpretations by historians since, and so I discuss it in some detail. The discussions, uh, Slade <coughs> prepared the initial draft of the meeting minutes. The draft indicated that McKenna strongly asserted that continuous voyage was valuable to Britain as a belligerent, especially in a war against Germany. Even if goods were not seized, freights and insurance would rise due to the risk of seizure. Gray thought otherwise and pointed out the difficulties of determining the ultimate destination of the goods. Neutrals likely would protest as during the South African War, and Britain would have to retreat from its position as it had done then. Gray thought institution of the International Prize Court was important and therefore, quote, certain concessions, not of vital importance, might be made in order to prevent the present conference from coming to a barren conclusion. After discussing the issues of sinking neutral prizes and conversion of merchant ships to warships on the high seas, Gray authorized Britain's delegates to surrender continuous voyage in return for Germany's agreement on the three lists of contraband and restrictions on the right to sink neutral prizes. The delegates were to maintain Britain's position on the conversion of merchant ships, but failing acceptance, the best possible agreement was to be made. After review, Gray suggested three additions to the draft minutes. There was an exchange of those positions with uh, McKenna, and at the end, uh, the parties agreed that that agreement had been reached. Indeed, uh, McKenna uh, wrote to Gray saying that there was a misunderstanding and there was no substantial difference of opinion between himself and Gray regarding the decision arrived at at the meeting. The, thus, the final meeting minutes included not only proposed additions made by Gray, but also McKenna's further response to Gray's argument on the value of continuous voyage to Britain. Germany and Britain soon reached an understanding on Britain's classes about contraband and free goods at the conference and elimination of the doctrine of continuous voyage, except for absolute contraband for which it was retained. The categorizations favored Britain and resolved issues that had arisen during the Russo-Japanese War. Foodstuffs and fuel were included in the list of conditional contraband, while raw cotton and numerous raw materials were free goods that could never be considered contraband. Moreover, Germany even went some way to meet Britain with regard to destruction of neutral prizes. However, the United States was now the impediment to a final agreement. While it agreed with the list of absolute and conditional contraband, it would not surrender continuous voyage at all, even if that broke up the entire conference. The United States Naval Delegate, Admiral Charles Stockton, thought the military value of continuous voyage was exaggerated. In return for surrendering the right as to conditional contraband, he said, quote, continent was given requirements of special notification at time of blockade and claims for unlimited destruction of neutral prizes. Finally, the United States conceded the point. Stockton's announcement of the change in position was greeted with, quote, great applause. On 26 February, the conference met in plenary session and signed the declaration concerning the laws of maritime war. The Admiralty, as I mentioned, viewed the results of the conference favorably. Slade prepared a memorandum based on the draft proof of articles of the convention, which was referred to First Sea Lord Fisher and First Lord McKenna. Slade stated, quote, taking the draft as a whole, the majority of the proposed rules follow our existing law. Slade considered substitution of the rayon action of the blockading squadron as the limit within which the seizure, which seizures allowed for a breach of blockade to be actually a concession. But he was concerned about how British prize courts would, result, would receive, quote, this very shadowy and indefinite clause because they had not previously accepted it. Slade noted that the law officers in 1900 had recommended acceptance of the rule, now agreed, 
that members of the enemy armed forces found on board neutral passenger ships could be taken as prisoners of war. Britain had also accepted that neutral merchant ships convoyed by neutral warships were not subject to search or seizure. Slade concluded, quote, on the other hand, the continental powers have made very considerable concessions to us and have in most points accepted the rules which have been administered by our courts. Green was more positive in his analysis. He thought, quote, it will be seen that as regards continuous voyage, the concession proposed falls short of what was under consideration when the subject was before their lordships in December last. The rule is maintained intact as regards absolute contraband, and as regarding conditional contraband shipped for a country with no seaboard, <coughs> such as the Transvaal in the late war, the belligerent would have the same rights as if it were shipped to a hostile port. Britain have, had obtained a favorable agreement on transfer of enemy ships to a neutral state, nation after the outbreak of war. On blockade, England carried entirely its view that the blockade of an enemy's port or coast should not, as regards capture of neutral vessels, be restricted to a limited cordon of vessels off the blockaded area. The radius of action should give, according to uh, Green, that elasticity to the action of a blockading fleet, which is actually essential. He then concluded, the general result seems to be that as a neutral, Great Britain gains and as a belligerent, while she loses claims to the exercise of some extreme rights which have been put forward on her behalf, she gains in the clearer definition of a belligerent's powers of action under international law and in being able to, set against, to act against neutral trade with an enemy within the powers reserved without difficulties such as those which arose in the case of the South African War. First, uh, Lord McKenna approved and agreed with Green's analysis. The final report of the delegation to Foreign Secretary Gray was equally positive. It concluded that it, quote, is a matter of congratulation that in respect to the important subject of blockade, we have been able to secure full recognition of the principles on which you directed us to lay stress. Gray asked the cabinet to authorize the British delegates to sign the convention because the conclusions were, quote, in accordance with the instructions already, already approved. Now, as I indicated in my introduction, historians have struggled to explain adequately Britain's supposed failure to protect its belligerent rights at the London Conference. And as we've just seen, uh, it appears that uh, they did protect their belligerent rights at the London Conference. When you look at the explanations or arguments presented by various historians, however, none of them withstand scrutiny. John Coogan, Abner Offer, and Nicholas Lambert have argued that the Declaration of London was inconsistent with the Admiralty's war plans against Germany. <coughs> however, the, however, these arguments rest on the belief and the position that the 1907 war plans were mere propaganda and ignored the recently rediscovered 1909 war plans. The Admiralty's strategy for war with Germany, especially as embodied in the 1909 war plans, envisioned an, an observational blockade of Germany's ports and coasts with several layers of warships stationed at greater distances. The Royal Navy's war plans, therefore, were consistent with the concept of a rayon induction for the enforcement of a blockade. Coogan, Offer, and Nicholas Lambert have also presented explanations for Britain's alleged irrational ex expansion of neutral rights and surrender of belligerent rights at the London Conference. Coogan contends, quote, second thoughts, close quote, arose on surrendering continuous blockade at the meeting on 15 December 1908. Offer claims that McKenna attempted to, quote, throw a spanner in the works, close quote, in mid-December 1908 when the Admiralty agreed the doctrine of continuous voyage could be abandoned. Noting Fisher's statement during the conference that, quote, in the next war, we should most certainly violate the Declaration of Paris and every other treaty that might prove inconvenient, he posits a Machiavellian strategy by Fisher, who had no intention of following any international agreement limiting Britain's belligerent rights. He also suggests that neither Slade nor Otley both of whom allegedly were losing Fisher's confidence at the time, received a proper briefing and so took positions inconsistent with Fisher's plans. He concludes, quote, Fisher may have allowed Otley and Slade to get on with the job, of the job in the interest of good relations with the liberal government and also as a subterfuge which might create false confidence in Germany. 
Most recently, Nicholas Lambert has claimed a, quote, hitherto kept secret plan for economic warfare against Germany that was unveiled by Fisher in late 1908. For Lambert, the various approvals by the Admiralty of the positions to be taken at the conference, quote, did not constitute total approval, close quote. According to Lambert, Gray misled McKenna into believing continuous voyage would not be compromised unless Germany gave up much more than it had offered as of 15 December. Lambert speculates that McKenna gave in to Gray because he recognized, quote, inevitable defeat on a seemingly minor technical point, and because, quote, he may have wanted to keep his powder dry in anticipation of the upcoming debate on the number of capital ships to be laid down the next year. Lambert argues Fisher officially objected to the London Conference without success. He relies on some of Fisher's typical outlandish statements, including the same one quoted by Offer. According to Lambert, quote, Fisher believed that it would prove cost-effective for Britain cynically to disregard the law and accept the financial penalty afterward. The Admiralty, including McKenna, had a, quote, cavalier attitude toward the sanctity of international agreements. Remarkably, Lambert asserts that McKenna misled the House of Commons in 1911 when he stated that the Board of Admiralty was consulted before the declaration was signed and that both he and the Board supported it. Now, as any good trial lawyer knows to be valid, a theory of the case must fit all of the known facts. The arguments presented by Coogan, Offer, and Nicholas Lambert, however, fail the fit test. The discussions and memoranda arising from the meeting on 15 December among Gray, McKenna, and the British delegates do not indicate second thoughts, an attempt by McKenna to engage in sabotage, or an effort by Gray to hoodwink McKenna. Lambert's speculation about the reasons for McKenna's actions are just that, is just that, speculation. It is not based on evidence. Fairly read, the meeting minutes and communications exchanged reveal a full ventilation of the pros and cons of whether to surrender a continuous voyage and what to demand in return. Coogan, Offer, and Lambert ignore the fact that Britain obtained more in exchange for partially abandoning continuous voyage than it was willing to concede. The doctrine continued to apply to absolute contraband, and Britain obtained significant restrictions on destruction of neutral prizes. Britain also received important compensation in the agreed lists of absolute and conditional contraband and free goods. Those lists, which included foodstuffs and fuel as conditional contraband and all manner of raw materials as free goods, favored Britain when it was a neutral and would limit issues with neutrals as it had experienced in 1899 to 1900 and 1904 to 1905. Far from indicating incompetence, the analyses prepared by Slade and others in the Admiralty on the topics for the conferences re conference reveal a solid grasp of the essential issues and provide a sound basis for the positions ultimately adopted. Offering Lambert's reliance on Fisher's views on the laws of warfare, and in Lambert's case, the Admiralty's alleged views as well, ignore the fact that neither Fisher nor the Admiralty could decide to ignore international law during time of war. Only the British government not some individual or even a department could make a decision of such importance. Even Maurice Hankey recognized at the time that views such as those held by Fisher and others in the Admiralty, quote, that in time of war these international treaties will at once be swept away, were delusive and dangerous. Fisher surely understood from his experiences as a technical naval delegate at the 1899 Hague Conference and the events during the South African War and the Russo-Japanese War that international agreements once made were not easily ignored. He often made outlandish statements for effect and for possible deterrence. Fisher had a visceral old school reaction to any laws of warfare. As Viscount Escher recorded in his diary in January 1909, quote, Jackie is furious at our yielding points to other powers at the Naval Conference. However, anger and outlandish statements by Fisher do not establish a hidden agenda to tear up the Declaration of London or ignore the laws of warfare if war came. Instead, Fisher's statements reflect frustration and impotence. While Fisher may well have been focused on Lord Charles Beriford's charges and discussions regarding the future naval building program during the same period, the documents show he reviewed and approved many, if not all, of positions taken by Slade, Otley, and the Admiralty at the conference. Indeed, Fisher could not be furious at what was occurring at the conference unless he knew what was happening there. Finally, Nicholas Lambert ignores evidence that does not support his theory. In his view, approvals really are not approvals. 
Fisher's alleged strong objections to the conference are contradicted by his approval of minutes and memoranda by Slade and others. Lamb asserts that McKenna misled the Commons in 1911 when he unequivocally stated that Fisher and the Admiralty were consulted and approved of the declaration. However, Lambert ignores the facts that Slade, Lord Dessart, Otley, and the Admiralty supported the declaration even when it subsequently was criticized. Given the United States ratification of the declaration, it must have been wrong too under Lambert's theory. Thus, a careful examination of the internal discussions as well as the results of the conference contradicts the traditional views of naval historians regarding the London Naval Conference. The Admiralty understood fully the positions being taken. The meeting minutes and communications exchanged at the Admiralty and with the Foreign Office before and during the conference reveal a full ventilation of the pros and cons of the various positions taken and what to demand in return for surrendering belligerent rights. Slade, Otley, and McKenna were neither duplicitous nor mendacious. They were not ignorant of the implications of the issues being discussed and the positions being taken. Sir John Fisher was aware of the internal discussions and did not strenuously oppose the Admiralty's positions. There was no preconceived plan to simply ignore the Declaration of London in time of war, either within the Admiralty or by Fisher. Any argument to the contrary ignores the realities of the era. As Isabel Hull recently concluded, quote, Britain took law enormously seriously. The extensive analyses and discussions within the government and the Admiralty belie the notion that the laws of naval warfare were of little or no moment in naval thinking or planning. The gentlemen, and they were all gentlemen in the classical sense, charged with governing nations, running departments, and leading navies, would not simply tear up international agreements the moment war came. A gentleman's word was his bond. Far from unduly surrendering belligerent rights to the detriment of Great Britain, the Declaration of London resulted from Britain's search for a reasonable middle ground, one that recognized its continuing reliance on the Royal Navy for its national defense, as well as the fact that it was no longer the world's only naval superpower free to impose its will on maritime commerce. It could no longer act unilaterally and with little regard for other navies, as it searched for a legal framework that would allow, would allow it to exercise its naval strategy. It therefore needed to compromise on key issues. Britain sought to balance its needs as a neutral with the maintenance of belligerent rights it wanted to exercise in a modern war. Great Britain's objective was to determine the laws of naval warfare that would allow it to maintain its ability to defend and protect itself and its empire, whether as a belligerent or as a neutral. The Royal Navy had wanted an 800-mile radius of action at the 1907 conference for blockades. In the declaration, it got more, an elastic rayon action that only the Royal Navy could effectively impose and enforce against other continental powers, including Germany. Britain also had to balance its increased reliance on maritime trade to meet its internal needs, especially for food. Great Britain believed it likely that it would be neutral in any future conflict, much as it has had been for over half a century since the end of the Crimean War. Far from unduly broadening belligerent rights against neutrals, the Declaration of London expanded neutral rights to the benefit of Britain. A more appropriate conclusion, therefore, is that Britain's eventual rejection of the Declaration of London was a good deal lost. Thank you.